going on to our topic today. Last week, we talked about um, understanding what together means in the community of God, and we talked about the importance of um, strengthening one another if we're going to come together, right? But we're going to talk about reaching more as a community. Now, Ecclesiastes chapter 4, 9, and 10, you know this one. It says, two are better than one because they have a good return for their hard work. If either should fall, one can pick up the other. But how miserable are those who fall and don't have a companion to help them up? All right? A very known verse. Togetherness, though, is so much more than avoiding the misery of maybe one day falling and not having someone to help you get up, right? Togetherness in the kingdom of God goes deeper than that and than, you know, having someone to help you up. And I don't think I can stress enough the importance of understanding togetherness in the kingdom of God as a place where we not only develop healthy and strong relationships with God and with one another, but also at the same time, we learn to take our faith deeper within our own selves, deeper within our families, deeper within our communities, deeper within our workplaces, pretty much deeper wherever we go. That's what the kingdom of God is there for, to learn how to take that faith deeper in those places that God calls us to. And at the same time, to be able to do that, God says, you're going to have help because you cannot do this by yourself. You can't, right? So as human beings, though, here's a problem. Once we've created a community, a group, or a family that we like, that we feel comfortable in, that uh, we feel safe in it, often it becomes very difficult and challenging to reach more, to allow space for more, to allow space for others. We can become very overprotective, right? You know how long it took us to create this safe space, right? How dare someone else come in and jeopardize that, right? And as human beings, you know, it's kind of part of us to be that protective uh, person, right? To protect what we have, to protect um, the unity that we have. Is my microphone off or on? Sorry. Okay. And, and sometimes, unintentionally, we can make others feel like an outsider, right? Sometimes intentionally, sometimes unintentionally. Now, don't get me wrong, though. By all means, we ought to always keep our eyes open because even Jesus warns us that there will be times where there will be wolf disguised as sheep. Matthew chapter 7, verse 15 tells us the following. It says, watch out for false prophets. They come to you dressed like sheep, but inside they are vicious wolves. So yes, we reach more, but we keep an eye open. One person cannot see everything at all times, but 50 people can definitely see more and can definitely do the job way better. But here's the thing. We weren't called into the kingdom of God to protect it. We were called into the kingdom of God to proclaim it. God can protect the kingdom of God on his own and is more than capable to do that. And God can proclaim it all on his own as well if he wanted to, right? But then he invites us to participate in it. And while participating in it, there's something marvelous that happens. We start understanding and recognizing how God's grace moves within this world, and we become moved by that. And as we get to see more of that, we want to get more involved in it because you're just amazed at how marvelously God's grace works in people's lives. I remember every mission trip I've been, in, I've been to in my life, and I've been more than a handful, a lot of them in my boarding school where we would visit different villages around our school, but every mission trip I've been into, it always ended with a desire to proclaim more, a desire to invest more, a desire to participate more, a desire to reach more. It always ended with confession too because I wasn't doing enough or repentance because I was um, 
too comfortable. And I've been humbled time after time during those mission trips where I think I'm going over there to bless people, but actually you're often the one that comes out more blessed. I've been humbled time after time when I see their faces and just their desire to, to see more, their desire to hear more, their desire to know more, their desire to pray more. It's always, it's always please stay a little longer. Please pray more with us. Please read the word of God more with us. Please, let's sing one more song. And it just humbles you. Why? Because it hurts when I come back to my own reality, my own world, and too quickly I mold to my world of comfort where one hour of worship is just enough. And if... The worship goes a little too long because the pastor preached too long, then it just interferes with the rest of my schedule, <laughs> my Sunday, right? And I'm not happy. Ironically, years later, I'm now on the other side of the fence where I'm the pastor preaching, right? And I make people sad because sometimes I went over a little too much. But that's not the case. I often get the complaint that I preach too short. That's interesting, right? Not too long. I bet someone's going to start complaining. Though. <laughs> when Jesus calls his disciples, this is what happens. And when he invites them to participate into the kingdom of God, right? And when I say Jesus calls his disciples in the New Testament, you have to understand that Jesus calls you too because you are a follower of Jesus Christ. So, you know, it applies. The same rule applies. When Jesus calls his first disciples, one that always stands out the most to me is Nathaniel. I don't know if you know that he was one of the disciples, but Nathaniel. And now it's an interesting story, and it's found in John 1, 45 through 51. And it reads like this. It says, Philip found Nathaniel and said to him, We have found the one Moses wrote about in the law and the prophets, Jesus, Joseph's son from Nazareth. Nathaniel responded, hmm, Can anything from Nazareth be good? Philip said, Come and see. So Jesus saw Nathanael coming toward him and said about him, Here is a genuine, genuine Israelite in whom there is no deceit. Nathanael asked him, How do you know me? Jesus answered, Before Philip called you, I saw you under the fig tree. And I can imagine Nathanael telling Philip, Did you tell me where you found me? <laughs> no. But then he says, Nathanael replied, Rabbi, you are God's son. You are the king of Israel. Jesus answered, and this is the part I love, do you believe because I told you that I saw you under the fig tree? You will see greater things than these. And that was just the beginning. Can you imagine Nathaniel being surprised? Like, wow, you knew where I was? And Jesus said, like, just wait until you begin to see. And then as he begins his journey with Jesus, Nathaniel begins to see. He begins to see not only lepers being healed at the sound of his words, but also being loved and being seen with compassion. He begins to see not only storms being hushed by demons, also being hushed. He begins to see not only the sick being healed, but also forgiven of their sins. It's like, what? Remember that time when four friends brought a paralytic to heal, to be healed? And the first thing that Jesus says is, your sins are forgiven. It's like, no, that's not why we brought them, but thank you. And of course, the Pharisees in the back are going, shh, 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 shh. can he forgive sins? And he says, well, what's easier to do? To say to someone, your sins are forgiven or get up and walk? And it's like, well, your sins are forgiven. And it's like, well, just to prove you who I am, he tells a paralytic man, get up and walk. And everyone is hushed. And Nathaniel is going, wow. He begins to see not only demon-possessed men being freed, but also sent to proclaim the good news. Like that guy who was living among the tombs, who would go around howling and scaring people, and he would be chained time after time, right? But he would be so strong that he would break chains, and his reputation would be known around the city. But then Jesus comes and says, out. And then the demons go out. And then he says, go. And then he goes into the city and starts telling them about Jesus. Nathaniel goes, wow, 
I see. He begins to see not only Jesus being crucified and give his last breath on that cross, but then he sees Jesus coming back, looking at him face to face. And the last thing that he tells his disciples, who showed them everything he could show them in those three years that he did ministry, he tells them, hey, you know what, you and I, we've reached a lot of people, haven't we? It's like, yeah. We've done a lot of things together, haven't we? Yeah. And I'm pretty sure we could do this more and more. Yes. But now I must go. Oh, no, why, Jesus, why? You just came back. Why do you have to go? But don't worry. You will not be alone. The Holy Spirit will come, and he will empower you to do more and greater things. Like, wait a second. First you told me, just wait and see. And now you're telling me there's more to see even after this resurrection? It's like, yes, you bet. And that's what got them exciting. It's like, wait, I thought we saw everything with Jesus here on earth, and now there's a Holy Spirit that's going to come and allow us to see more. This is my paraphrase, of course, but this is where I get it from. Matthew chapter 28, verses 18 through 20, and Acts 1, 7 through 8 says this, Jesus came near and spoke to them as he was getting ready to leave. I have received all authority in heaven and on earth. Therefore, go and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, teaching them to obey everything that I have commanded you. Look, I myself will be with you every day until the end of this present age. And then in Acts chapter 1, verse 7 and 8 says, Jesus replied, It isn't for you to know the times or seasons that the Father has set by his own authority. Rather, you will receive power when the Holy Spirit has come upon you, and you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem, in all Judea and Samaria, and to the end of the earth. Everywhere you go. But here's the thing. As the disciples caught on to that and they received the Holy Spirit, yes, they do begin to reach more. And yes, they are amazed. They're like, wow, God is still at work. People are turning their hearts around. Lives are being changed. Families are being healed. People are still being healed. And they are amazed at what God is doing. And so what happens is their passions are so fueled that they obviously have only one thing to say to God. Where to next? Literally, where to next? But it doesn't come easily. As your passion, to reach, as your, as your passion is fueled to reach more, and you say to God, where to next? That next destination is not always going to be easy. It always has its challenges. Just look at the life of Paul, right? He was passionate, but when he got stoned in one of the cities and left almost to die and then kicked out of the city, he said, where to next? God said, go back in. Okay. <laughs> so he goes back in and then he preaches again, right? But then he sees just marvelous things happening. It's like people are being converted. People are changing their hearts and lives. And that's just the most amazing thing that you can witness by the grace of God. And then he says, where to next? Oh, that island or that city. All right. And on his way, of course, he gets shipwrecked. But he's on it again. And then he gets shipwrecked again. And then he gets jailed. But he's on it again. That where to next is not always going to be a paved road and easy for you, right? Because then you would eliminate the amazing aspect of God's work and God's grace if it was too easy. But then God says, it's hard, but let me show you what my grace can do. Let me show you what my power can do. Let me show you what my love can do. Family, we cannot reach more if we are not passionate and hungry to see God at work here in our lives, here in our city, here in this nation. It just doesn't happen that way. It doesn't happen automatically. There's, it's not a transaction. There has to be a transformation that takes place within us to grow that passion, to have that childlike curiosity like Nathaniel and say, what? That was amazing, God. He's like, wait, 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 wait. Wait until I show you more. 
and it's just, you know, one after another. You're so addicted to that grace of God. He's like, God, show me more. All right, but you have to ask me, where to next? Okay, okay, where to next? All right, right there. Ah, but it's not going to be easy. That's fine. Our passion will lead us, and your presence will lead us. Family, we cannot do that without the passion that God has placed in us through the Holy Spirit. And we cannot definitely do that if we put parameters in God's work of grace and say, God, you know what? You can amaze me, and you can show me your grace within these parameters. <laughs> God is scratching his head. It's like, what parameters? Well, you know, I've got time on Sundays from 1030 to 1130, so during that parameter, you can show me how amazing your grace is. All right, God, on your mark, it said, go. <laughs> Sorry to break it to you, but you cannot see that if we put God into a, a time frame and say, this is the only space that you can show me your grace. It just doesn't work that way, right? This is the only space where I can see how amazing you are and how faithful you are. I'm sorry, it's not going to happen. But we are so, and I'm, I'm guilty of it too, right? Because I used to criticize my own pastors too, but we cannot. We have to be able to let God bring that passion and feel that passion in every aspect of our lives. Or even think that we can achieve great things or reach out more only if my name was known only if people knew who i was only if i had a title or a position or a place no god doesn't need that either he just needs you to say where to next it's god's design not ours it comes from us to accomplish the kingdom ministry that God has called us to. And Romans chapter 12, verses 3 to 8, reminds us of that fountain, right? Where it comes from us, not, an, not individually. It comes from us. Ultimately, it comes from the body of Christ. Romans chapter 12, verse 3 to 8, it says this, Because of the grace that God gave me, I can say to each one of you, don't think of yourself more highly than you ought to think. Instead, be reasonable since God has measured out a portion of faith to each one of you. We have many parts in one body, but the parts don't all have the same function. In the same way, though there are many of us, we are one body in Christ and individually we belong to each other. Individually, ultimately, we belong to each other if you are part of the kingdom of God. We have different gifts that are consistent with God's grace that has been given to us. If your gift is prophecy, you should prophesy in proportion to your faith. If your gift is service, devote yourself to serving. If your gift is teaching, devote yourself to teaching. If your gift is encouragement, devote yourself to encouraging. The one giving should do it with no strings attached. The leader should lead with passion. The one showing mercy should be cheerful. And ultimately, anything we do as kingdom people, as community that belongs to God's kingdom. We do it so that in the end, God is praised. We do it so in the end, God receives all the glory. We do it so in the end, God is made known. We do it in the end so that God is made famous. It's not about us. And we just saying that, right? It's all about who? It's all about Jesus. I've tried to live, believe it or not, a life where it's all about me. And my best explanation of how that feels and how unsatisfying it is it's like a nightmare i had one day i like running but i don't like running on treadmill because it's just the most boring thing where you're just running one place but i had this dream where i was running and i was getting ready to hit that finish line but the finish line kept moving further out <laughs> and i was like all right i'm almost there i'm running out of breath and then I feel like I'm getting there, and then the finish line moves away, and then it moves away, and then it moves away, and you just get tired and tired and tired, and you never get there, and you're never satisfied no matter how hard you try. That's how I felt when I tried to live for my own self. It's never going to fill you. The Bible has wisdom in telling us that there's something that God has created in us that has wired us in such a way that we receive so much fulfillment when first and foremost we live for the one who created us and then we live the way that he has created us to live for one another. 
to enjoy togetherness, to enjoy community and be there for each other. First Peter 4, 10 through 11 will remind you of this. It says, each of you should use whatever gift you have received to serve others as faithful stewards of God's grace in its various forms. If anyone speaks, they should do so as one who speaks the very words of God. If anyone serves, they should do so with the strength God provides, so that in all things, in all things, God may be praised through Jesus Christ. To him be the glory and the power forever and ever. Amen. Ultimately, that's why God brings us together. Right? It's not for a name. It's just for his name, so that he may be glorified. And I'm always, always encouraged by this community that God has put together. I'm, I'm always encouraged when you share with me and tell me, I just witnessed with someone, or I just witnessed to someone at the bus, at the bus stop. Great. Keep doing that. Or when you share with me that, you know, I just talk to someone at, at my work about God. Great. Keep doing that. Keep reaching more. Or when you post your, your testimony on social media, yes, keep doing that. You don't know who's going to read that. When I hear about how you pray for each other, when I hear about how you tangibly and practically support one another, when I hear about how you sometimes just are there for one another, just to listen, just to sit. I'm always encouraged, and I hear. I hear a lot of things, and I hear many good things. And I want to say this to you. Let's continue to do that and not stop, to reach more. But we cannot do it just on our own. We need one another because when we ask God and say, where to next? <laughs> it's not going to be easy. It's not going to be a paid road. But together, I assure you, we can get there. The finish line won't move like my nightmare, but we will reach there. And we will say and we will glorify one and only one name. Whose name? Jesus. Right? So I pray that together we do that. That we ask first and foremost, God, my passion may have been asleep or my passion may have, you know, just not ignited yet. Or my passion, you know, may have been just too caught up with so many other things. But to pray first and foremost for our own faith, that we may grow to love and desire the things that God wants to show us. When God shows you one thing and you say, wow, God, that was amazing. Let me tell you, God in the back of his head is saying, oh, just wait and see. <laughs> but we have to be able to Give him the space to show us and make the time in our day to show us and make ourselves available to step in faith and show us. And together we can do that. Amen? Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we all come from different journeys in life and we're all trying to step into so many unknown areas. We have choices every day. We have futures to think about. We have future of, futures of loved ones to think about. We have our own future <laughs> that we need to worry and think about. Lord God, there's just so much. And sometimes it can be drowning. Sometimes it can be overwhelming. But Lord, your songs remind us time after time but that you are a faithful God, that you will not fail, that we belong to a kingdom that doesn't play by the rules of this world but surpasses them by showing us it's your amazing grace that allows us to remain in this place and say, wow, God, we want to see more. I want to depend more. I want to trust you more. I want to lean on and lean in harder. I want our faith to grow deeper within our own selves, deeper into our families, to the fabric of our own community and our own city. Lord, we desire that, and I just pray that you fuel that passion in us, individually, collectively, because it's through us, Lord God, that you allow us to reflect the love as they see how people live together, as Scripture says, 
harmoniously and in unity. They will see your love by the way we love one another. And so I ask God that you just continue to empower us, to strengthen us, to encourage us. We know it's been just some very difficult times. But I pray that you re-strengthen us, that we may continue, Father, to do your will, to do what you have called us to do as a church, as people living in your kingdom, to proclaim it, dear God. And we pray this in Jesus' name. Amen.